one other bowl game involving an ACC team going on. That's the Sun Bowl. And amongst all the illegal aliens down in El Paso, it's UCLA 14 and Pittsburgh 6. That's with 11.15 to go in the second quarter. It's so creepy. It sounds like one of those like traditional sports calls. He has an iconic voice. We just have so few options in terms of ideas to choose from. You know, even Biden, um, this recent trip to Mexico, securing the borders, it says... You know, that's that's his entire that's his stated policy goal for the situation at this time. And no wonder it's it's so pervasive with everybody in the country. There's like there's nothing else to choose from. What would that have sounded like in a society where there were choices for? First of all, probably it would have just been as simple as that little piece wouldn't have been inserted. But let, let me give it a try. Let me give it a try. I'm going to try. OK, here we are at the Maryland uh, Duke football game. Uh, Duke passes the pigskin and it's caught. It's uh. It's in the hands of a, of a Duke receiver, and he's really cradling that uh, ball. Uh, and it's a lot like uh, these masses of humanity that are moving across the Texas border because uh, there are unclear policies on both sides of the fence, including a dictator in Mexico and a beleaguered president at home. And it's really putting a lot of undue stress on El Paso communities. And Duke scores the touchdown. Very <laughs> good. Recording from the awesome Frontier Tech Law Studios in New Haven, Connecticut, it's the 10 Billion People Podcast, where we talk about, in the most unorthodox way possible, about the issues of migration and global movement that are only getting harder as the world approaches 10 billion humans. Here are your hosts, Damian DeNoble and Eli McDonald. That, that's, a hell of a, uh, that's a hell of an audio clip. That was done live. Uh, during uh, by an NC State radio announcer Gary Hahn between uh, during the game between uh, Duke versus Maryland. Now I I am a Duke alum, some of you might know, and like most or all Duke alums, I don't watch Duke football, so I was unaware of this clip until it was sent to me, typical fashion by my friend who's a UNC fan because UNC fans watch Duke football games. <laughs> And then they want to make fun of us for how bad the team is. But everybody at Duke's like, no, what? I don't even watch. I'm like, why would you even bother making fun of our football team? Oof. Yeah, I'm a UNC yeah. fan. That's way too much commitment. I couldn't sit through one of those games. Yeah. But. Yeah, you're saying, you're saying it doesn't happen that way? Born and raised in UNC country, this guy. So now th- this, we're, we're, we're going to touch on this story, but this, this is kind of just... Uh, I, I want to say this guy got a lot of uh, people, had a lot of people in his corner after this, checking the Twitter, j- checking Reddit, you know, you know, a lot of people are like, well, he's just telling the truth. You know, he's telling the truth. It, it's uh, now let's examine that for just a little bit before we jump into our, into our main stories, just a little bit. When people say he's telling the truth, to me, it's indicative of, of the fact that we've completely lost the thread on any sort of, uh, normal conversation about immigration yes. yeah right uh so not only are they dismissing the fact that a whole group of people is being nixed here you know being being othered but um they're saying hey, you know that, that's the way i would say it right he's saying what well, he's, he's saying what, what we're all thinking we've he's, heard that a few times in the last in the last few years right yeah and and so the question becomes okay so el paso clearly does have a lot of people that are coming from all over the world across the Mexico border and are at the time of arriving asking for asylum or as we'll talk about now may have the option to ask for some of these parole policies that have been put in place by the Biden administration. Right. And so part of me goes, okay, well, he's not wrong, but is it a put down? To me, the wrong part is putting it in as a put down, right? Because it's, it's like a conclude. It's a statement that says, Oh, El Paso has all those illegals coming in. And in that statement is like, that is a horrible thing. It's a dog whistle. And it doesn't, it refuses, I think, to engage with the fact that that issue of migration through the U.S. southern border is extremely complicated. And the only way we solve it is actually through some sort of congressional action. That's the only long-term solution. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I think that sort of thing is just dismissive of everything. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm not watching these games, but in case they have a little uh, immigration analysis piece they put in every game, there's 
why else would he be throwing that in there? And it rolled off his tongue so smooth. It's like it's like that little bit at the beginning of a speech you practice in front of a mirror. It's like he he didn't even I don't know. It rolled. Let's listen to it one more time. Game involving an ACC team going on. That's the Sun Bowl. And amongst all the illegal aliens down in El Paso, it's UCLA 14 and Pittsburgh 6. That's what the... Yeah, you'd almost miss it if you weren't a... That's what's creepy. It's it's creepy. It's creepy how that rhetoric sort of crept in. Now, I could hear one of my favorite comedians, for better or for worse, is Norm MacDonald. I could see that on the Norm Sports Show. Do you remember the old Norm Sports Show? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's sort of what that sounds like. And if it was in the context of, I'm clearly here at a comedy show to listen... Right where there might be some other commentary, maybe that would work. But the fact that it was in main that was mainstreamed is what tells me that I think the rhetoric, the xenophobic rhetoric, has shot up another level in the United States. For sure, you know, it's we're we're in a much different place than we were ten, twenty years ago. Yeah, Uh, because this is a guy who's like, I'm I'm fed up. Yeah, at some point in his mind, he said, "No, I'm just putting this." out there and there's people that agree with me and that's just the way it's going to be right and this show is about exploring why why is that like i I don't want to condemn him you know i've I've condemned him in a way right because i don't agree with it but i don't think he's unusual no 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 no. i agree i think this is actually a majority view in the u.s i think this could be a majority view and i think it's the direction of politics we've seen not just in Europe and the U.S., but we've seen this tone of like, keep these people out of my country, go global, which is part of what this podcast is about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hearing it in his tone, um, you know, from a team I grew up next to, maybe that's a little bit shocking, but it's, yeah, like you're saying, it's entirely unshocking. And and I later on, um, the thought keeps reoccurring that we just have so... In this show, I hope eventually maybe some some themes will emerge, some ideas about how we would want um, an immigration system to look, how we want it to work. But we just have so few options in terms of ideas to choose from. You know, even Biden, um, this recent trip to Mexico, securing the borders, it says, you know, that's, that's his entire, um, that's his stated policy goal for the situation at this time. And... No wonder it's it's so pervasive with everybody in the country. There's like there's nothing else to choose from. It's like e- even the people who are humanizing migrants are um, securing the border at at all costs. You know what I mean? It's just like there's just very few other narratives to choose from, and uh, understandable slip up if 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 you're terrified all the time. <laughs> so. What 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 would his uh, what would that have sounded like in a society where there were choices? For first of all, probably it would have just been as simple as that little piece wouldn't have been inserted into there. But let, let me give it a try. Let me give it a try. I'm gonna give it a try. Okay. Uh, here we are at the Maryland uh, Duke football game. Uh, Duke passes the pigskin and it's caught. It's uh, it's in the hands of uh, of a Duke receiver and he's really cradling that uh, ball. Uh, and it's a lot like uh, these masses of humanity that are moving across the Texas border because uh, there are unclear policies on both sides of the fence, including a dictator in Mexico and a beleaguered president at home. And it's really putting a lot of undue stress on El Paso communities. And Duke scores the touchdown. Very <laughs> good. You know? You know? Yeah. Like, I mean, we could just like combine Amy Goodman with with a number of different announcers and that yeah amy goodman amy goodman from democracy now Just, oh tell me this i uh, see see i'm, I'm totally that, isolated my that sounded like a perfect uh rendition of her like calling a football game is what i was getting at oh interesting that's an amy goodman i like she's, that she's just a uh famously uh yeah i guess famously lefty uh, reporter for democracy now he's he's very can i can i do it not lefty can i try to be more neutral can I okay. try one more yeah, call? Yeah. Yeah. One more call. Okay. Here comes... Make it realistic, though. It's an interception. It's okay. A Duke okay. receiver hasn't touched the ball in like four seasons. Wow. <laughs> if I'd watched football, I might be... Duke football, I might be offended. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. The uh, Duke quarterback lines up. He throws the pigskin into the air. 
It's spiraling, spiraling, spiraling out of control, like the situation at the southern border, which seems to be up to 2 million crossers. It's a combination of uh, recrossers, new crossers, people seeking refugee status from all over the world, and it's putting a lot of strain on communities who may have a point. We do need to secure the border, perhaps, right? It needs to be in combination with our respect for humanity. And the ball keeps on spiraling, and predictably, it ends in disaster. Maryland takes the ball. They're going the other way, uh, just like the next presidential administration, which is likely going to completely reverse the policies of the current one, and we're going to be back at zero again. Was that, was that like more moderate? Yeah, that's gripping stuff. That was, that was moderate enough to where you, you lost me halfway through, and then I tuned back in, and then I was, yeah, it was, it's it, kind of perfectly moderate, actually. It was thrown really high, that spiraling football. Mm, it was yeah. thrown really, because the quarterback's not that good. So instead of throwing a bullet, he actually threw a parabola that went up Yeah, yeah. 80 feet, came back down, probably the same distance, physics. Yeah, right? my, my quarterback's experiment, Mac Jones. The Patriots yeah. loves the high end over end passes too. Is that right? Yeah. Duke vote. throws hail marys on first and ten. <laughs> that's what that's what Duke does. All right, all right, very good. Uh, I know the sport. All right, let's get back into it. Uh, let's 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 actually get into our show. So today's main topic is what Eli? What are we What are we doing? Yes, yeah, so we have um, we have a heavy a heavy topic today, um, yeah. and and I think I think this topic undergirds a lot of um what we've been talking about it's been the writing on the wall um with a lot of stories we're talking about what happens uh to people when they don't make it people who um die crossing deserts die in the mediterranean um the politics of immigrant bodies exactly might what say. implications for international law um yeah straight and then straight down to the personal what what happens to these individuals what happens to the families um Whatever. Yeah. And we're going to be using as uh, the centerpiece of our discussion an amazing article written by Alexis Okioo, a, a staff writer at The New Yorker. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm probably not. Uh, and she writes uh, about human rights issues. And she wrote this amazing article in the January 2023 issue called Letter from Italy, The Missing, uh, that centers on, um, centers on an immigrant from Eritrea. It's kind of the centerpiece, a woman who, uh, went to Sudan and then her husband tried to cross and the question becomes, did he survive or not on this Mediterranean ship? And that's used as an exploration. What happens to the bodies of dead immigrants who try to cross the Mediterranean? In right. many cases end up at the bottom of the ocean. Who takes responsibilities for them? Who doesn't take responsibility for them? Who should take responsibility for them? And then what are the barriers to their families to finding them? And then what happens if they can't find them? Because there are legal repercussions for right. that. And this feeds into our prior, we've talked in, this is episode five, we talked in prior episodes, uh, you know, about this idea that there are parts of the globe where there is no law. Mm -hmm. There is no law. Yeah. Uh, and who has to take responsibility in the ocean when jurisdiction is unclear, when it doesn't exist? Right. Right. And when there are competing, competing uh, directives, either ones emanating from inside oneself that are ethical and moral or ones that are coming over the radio from your immediate superiors. What do you do? Right. Okay. So that's our main story. But then uh, in our show structure, if you're not familiar, we are going to cover some news topics that we think are interesting. They're not picked because they're timely necessarily, although most of them are. They're not picked because uh, there's some common theme. There's not yet, right? This podcast is all about finding those themes over time. Um, and we're going to cover the news items, then we're going to cover our main story, and then we always end on a profile of a person that it's in some way who, that you know, typically know or could know by, you know, looking at a Wikipedia, uh, and uh, that's hopefully related to the topic. And today's person is the great, great basketball player, one of my favorite basketball players of all time. I have a soft spot for doughy big men. Mark Gasol, uh, the Spanish national who was an NBA legend. His brother, Pau Gasol, was also an NBA legend. I think they're both surefire Hall of Famers. Mark Gasol, I'll just say this. I haven't heard anybody say this. He is the prototype for Nikola Jokic. I was about to say, yeah, comparing those two, I don't know if I call Mark Gasol doughy. He, he was for a little bit. Nikola's doughy. No, dude, Nikola slimmed down. He was doughy. Nikola liked Coca-Cola. 
Did you see him this? Have you seen him this year? I actually haven't watched. I, I'm almost. Uh, yeah, I haven't. Uh, he he slimmed down just like Marcus really? Gasol okay. did for a okay. few seasons. I think but Marcus Gasol could maybe. hit threes. He was a point yeah. center, uh, just a great teammate guy, and uh, turns out a true hero. He's yeah. actually gone onto the ocean to recover dead migrant bodies, as we'll cover at the end. Yeah. So let's start. Eli, yeah. uh, uh, Eli researches all of this. I am a full time attorney. So I'll tell you right away, I don't. And, uh, and then I look at this and we go through it. So Eli, what, what do we have for news here? So we've got some really big things that have happened um, since we were last here. Um, anybody who works in this field knows that it's a moving target. Almost, almost whatever uh, type of, of immigration you specify, and it's a moving target. And that's especially true for um, asylum and refugee law. Um, and Biden just came down with some huge, some huge changes in the last couple of weeks. Um, the, the three, ch- the, the three main changes, and we'll get into them a little more. This is actually kind of like a step zero change. MPP, the remain in Mexico, um, has been terminated, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, and it's being, uh, disbanded s- slowly. Um, massive, massive camps had grown, um, in that time. So there's still, um, Massive refugee camps. For Massive those refugee listening. camps, right? Yeah. yeah, and there's and and after being there for a long time, I think a lot of people are left without, um, with even less resources than when they arrived. So there's there's a big problem now. You know these, um, yeah, pe- people there with nowhere to go and no way to get there. Um, so MPP is winding down. Um, Title Forty Two, the public health measure um, used under Trump. Uh, it's been kind of a winding tail with Biden. He went to the courts trying to shut it down. Uh, the Supreme Court basically mandated that they continue uh, Title 42. And then we're, we're at kind of an interesting point here where Biden is continuing to argue against it, argue for its termination in court, um, but expanded it at the same time. So he's roped in a few more countries, Cubans, um, Haitians, Nicaraguans, I believe, um, who were previously exempt. Um, so let's stop there because that yeah. is the most interesting point, right? Yeah. So we, we've talked a lot about everybody that covers immigration eventually talks about the fact that a sitting president in the United States is a no-win position, right? Because both Democrats and Republicans, let's not forget, uh, the official position of the party is that we need both security and compassion for migrants. Now, in what proportion those two are meted out is very different, especially rhetorically. And uh, certainly under the Trump administration, they went all the way to the right where it was all security and no no compassion. But that wasn't true under Bush. That certainly wasn't true under Bush one. Um, And certainly wasn't true under Reagan, right? Who, let's not forget, had a giant amnesty, right? The word that the Republican Party does not want to utter, right? Right, right. Um, But the Democratic Party um, has a left wing uh, that wants to be all about compassion and wants to abolish ICE and, and, and wants to, uh, doesn't want to abolish borders that we talked about. That, that's a myth. That's a red herring. But certainly want to make asylum free flowing. Uh, the Biden administration, though, is not a left wing organization. They are a moderate administration in many ways, uh, certainly on border policy. And so he has to do two things at once. He has to both show compassion and show that he takes security seriously, all while trying to avoid fire from both the left and the right. And maybe cherry on top, comply with international and establish U.S. law. And and that's right. If we're lucky, if we're lucky. That's right. That's the balancing act. And so this new version of Title 42, you're absolutely right. On the one hand, he's speaking about both sides of his mouth. He's saying, hey, we are, uh, we are ending title 42 in right as quick as we can, as quick as we can. But on the other side, he is actually ramping it up, right? Because more people have joined it. Right. And then he's saying, and then to the other side, he's like, well, I've actually increased border security. Look. I've added these people to the Title 42 list, but then he goes, okay, but now we're actually going to let in 30,000 people through a new executive branch program, parole program from the countries of Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, yep. Ukraine, and what's the fifth one? I'm missing Haiti. Haiti. Yeah. Haiti. Yeah. Um, and it, they're all going to apply. It's actually, um, if you look at that program, 
they're all the way that, that what happens is somebody in the U.S. that knows them, a family member, right, uh, files the new form I-134A. It's the same form used for Ukrainian migrants. Mm. And once that 134A gets approved, the person who's the beneficiary will get a number that they can come to the border with to enter the United States, and they can then apply for a work permit. If it works like it did for Ukraine, I can tell you people are going to be coming across within two weeks Yeah, yeah. of like receiving um, some sort of benefit. So I think this is kind of momentous. I don't, I don't think it's yeah. getting enough press. This guy just created 360,000 new visas in a way. I agree with you. I think, uh, I think this is a good thing. And I think you have to take victories where you can get them. But the marketing of this uh, has had exactly what you just described right at the front and center. And there's other huge, um, huge changes in there that work directly against it or, or not that work differently than you might, um, than you might suspect a- after like reading the first three or four paragraphs of an article about this. So he's my understanding. Tell me if your understanding is different, but title 42, he, a lot of people in the Biden administration has said as much recognize that the justification is basically gone or quickly fading. Um, but title 42 has been a super, super effective mechanism for, for governance, right. For, um, for attempting to control, uh, regions of the border. So my understanding of what's happening is the restriction, the new restrictions that he's put in place. Um, the first being you have to apply, um, in any country you pass through. So you would have to apply for asylum in Mexico uh, before applying in the U.S. if you're coming up from Central America. Um, And that you can be, um, and that you're not eligible if you don't come through a port of entry. So if either of those things is true, you didn't apply in a country previously and you didn't come through a port of entry, you can be, you can use expedited removal to boot these people out. So (laughs) it's a really good thing, but, but I think the, the most vulnerable people um, who don't have the option to sit and, and apply from home. You know, people who, who have had to take off. Um, yeah, it's screwing them over. There's, you know. Yeah, so, so it's designed, it's what it's designed to do partly, right? It's, there's a few things in here. We know that Biden has a preference for bringing in workers. Mm-hmm. Right? He's been uh, working closely with the Northern Triangle countries uh, and with U.S. mission in Mexico to develop easier systems to bring in temporary workers. Yeah. And this, to me, sounds like he's, again, giving preference to economic migrants in a sense. He's saying, if you stay home and you apply through this, you can come work in the United States. Like, yeah. that, that's the path. And he's betting that the number of economic migrants that have been coming up to the border is significantly high. The question becomes, and the question in my mind is, what are the true, well, I don't want to say true numbers, I'm going to get pilloried for that, but what are the numbers of people that have asylum claims that they are making because they really do need protection? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In my experience, working with a lot of asylees, many, Many, and I, I want to say most, had an underlying economic reason to come to the United States. Now, does that mean that they didn't have terrible things happening at home? No, it doesn't. But um, would they have necessarily left if there was like a good job? Well, that's a chicken or egg situation. Mm-hmm. If there are good jobs, maybe there wouldn't be terrible things happening at home. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, they can't be in, they can't be entirely separated, but yeah. Correct. But I take your point for sure. But what do you think? You have a strong opinion on this. I think that that differs from mine quite a bit. I mean, it, I mean, yeah, I've I have a lot of thoughts on this. I at my core see a human a humane immigration system as um as an obligation of ours for for what the history is in, in Central America, South America, um, the Middle East, Africa, you could, you know, you can make the argument, um, with varying strength in, in different regions, but, um, in Central America specifically, I I see it as a totally factual statement, the level of, of intervention, um, and co-opting of, of resources and blah, 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 
Um, it has effects, huge effects. And, and I really see, yeah, regions that have been destabilized as a direct result of this. I, I feel some type of patriotic obligation to, to take these people in. Hmm. And that's, that's, that's where I sit on it. Um, and so what do you think of this Biden plan? I mean, where do, ultimately you see it as getting back to zero, like it just does nothing. You think everything cancels it, itself out? It's, it's smart in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not bashing, bashing it in its entirety, but I think the shortcomings are summed up in, uh, in Kamala's favorite quote, you know, do not come, do not come, do not yeah. come. And it's, if you work in this field, it's 101 level knowledge to understand that some proportion of, of immigrants um, and refugees are coming here because they have no choice. Oh, this so. is the quote. Do not come. Do not is this come. Quote? That's the one. I'm going to come. Is that? That's not. <laughs> is that? <laughs> yeah, that's maybe my. Uh, I hate that man. I do. I do. That is one of the funnier memes I've ever seen in my life. Oh, it's fantastic. In our field. Yeah, the horse is still funnier. Okay, but but it's yeah. you know why it's funny though? Also, I mean, it's funny for obvious reasons, but also what is the impact of getting on the border and telling people do not come, do not come? It was it was the completely opposite impact. Everybody came. Yeah. Right? With <laughs> yeah. Them, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel it's really easily marketable. Um, but for the clients, for the type of people that I was working with when I got passionate about this work, it doesn't do shit for them and, and may disadvantage them. People who, and anybody who's, who's had to pick up and leave and take off. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, may, maybe CBP. I think it's going to hurt trans youth a lot. I think it's going to hurt uh, women that are uh, in domestic, we call them domestic violence situations, but in situations where they're completely powerless to do anything, move around, it's going to really hurt them because who, who's going to, how are they going to apply, right? If they're in these situations. And I think it's going to favor exactly who the Biden administration wants to favor. And I think the majority of Americans um, say they favor, which is younger people of working age. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I th favoring people, I mean, if you look back at like the earliest, earliest immigration cases, it's like super well established that the executive branch has almost complete power on, yeah. on immigration. You can have whatever preferences you want. Um, you can like do whatever the hell you want in, in a lot of contexts. Um, but, you know, I want to live in a, in a country that adheres to, you know, some established um, you know, the 1951 con convention against torture that kind of birthed a lot of asylum and refugee law in, in Europe and the U S you know, I, I really value a lot of the, the ideas and the vision that that kind of encapsulates and, you know, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but then you're going to change, you know, the character of the, of the nation. Mm. And, and that's, that's what I really want to push back on. Cause yeah, you're never, I mean, I think part of the reason we're in such a quagmire in the immigration system is it's it's impossible to really i don't know you've been in in this side way um longer than i have i haven't even started yet it's impossible to um to win a lot of arguments on on legal reasoning alone at this point it's so convoluted congress hasn't stepped in for so long on certain things um i think if i if i thought about this in in ethical and, and along ethical and moral grounds um i get very mushy um and I think where I'm choosing to think through right now is where's, where are Europe and the United States going with their migrant policy? And I think what we're seeing in the U.S., what we've clearly seen with the Biden administration, what we saw before that with the Barack Obama, Obama's administration, although it wasn't framed that way by anybody but people working in the immigration field, is a turn towards the prioritization, prioritization of security and towards explicit language favoring uh, migrants who wish to work, right? And uh, specifically, let me be more specific about letting in people based on their ability to work rather than on their humanitarian need. The fear being that if you lead with 
a policy that prioritizes humanitarianism, uh, you get accused of uh, letting in the hordes as we, when we covered the great replacement theory last year, right? Last, last episode, right? You get accused of uh, things by specifically people on the very far right of, of, you know, letting in people who are going to run over the country. And I don't think that progressive policies are going to win because they, they've lost on every side. And I, and I, I just don't see them winning. And I, I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I just, I'm trying to see where we're going as we head towards 10 billion people. And right now, or at least I can say this progressive, progressive policies are losing. Definitely. And, and, and ironically the right, which is winning this battle is getting more rabid. Yeah. I mean, what are the tactics? It's scorched earth on one side and capitulation after the, one after the other on the other side. So like, of course, one side is going to lose its, its vision and like lose track of what it actually wants. And the other side's going to get greedier and greedier. That's like, that's how I see this. And, and that's why, that's why I kind of like stubbornly stick to a lot of these humanitarian based arguments. Uh, because, you know, I've been in this long enough to know it's not, even in a best case scenario, it's practically impossible in a lot of ways. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the real humanitarian ideals when it comes to immigration. But if we accept that before even making the argument, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, then like, then they've already won. And, and then you lose your chance at even pulling it back towards at least a slightly more humane um, practical system. So I, I think it's important to make to make those arguments. Um, I agree with you. And to be shameless on a, on a certain level. I, I think that's, that's why I'm so fed up with, uh, yeah, I don't know if we want to go here and we've talked about this before. That's, yeah. that's why I get fed up with progressive politics a lot is because, um, you know, you have to be shameless sometimes. You're holding, <laughs> you're holding on to me. Like, I, I, and it's like, I, I want all this. Yeah. It's just, I, I don't see a path forward with this. This is me. I want all this. But I don't see a path forward with this because at some point, politics has to work with everybody within the civilizational context you're in. And that's what makes yeah. it hard. Moving on to the next story. Next story. Just, just a quick follow-up uh, about what's happening in the UK with the scheme. The scheme. Some people don't want to see episode, uh, was it three? Episode two? Two mm -hmm. or three. Check that out on Spotify or Apple, wherever you listen to this podcast, all 10 of you. <laughs> okay. All right. So what's, what's the follow-up? So this happened, I was trying to remember the date we recorded episode three, uh, December 19th, this decision came out. So right after we recorded, um, high court in the UK, totally okay. Totally fine. Just pa pass it on all regards. Um, they're ramping up flights as we speak. I'm sure they're already underway. Um, we got to follow the story. This is insane. Yeah. yeah, they're aiming for tens of thousands was the number um, I read in the press release. Hotel Rwanda. Yep. About to yep. be so, so profitable. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny timing. Um, Biden bringing back the safe, or the third country requirement and, yeah. and the UK court um, okaying this plan based on the safe third country requirement. Um, Interesting. Not that I think they're connected. I just it's a funny coincidence. Well, why that, do you think it's funny? Give me your conspiracy theory. I don't know if it's a conspiracy theory. I think on the migrant side, what these stories are showing us is that um we're dealing with human will. People are gonna find a way um to get where they want to be. And on the government side and the legal side, um it's also a matter of will. Um you do what you need to, uh to do what you want. <laughs> and um yeah, like with Biden. Title 42 winding down, he's going to start using this and the port of entry thing as a different way to expedite people fast. Yeah, so it, it just seems like a continuation along the same track of trying to reach the same end through like increasingly tenuous legal means. Got it. Okay, so we have, here's what I see happening. Uh, the UK right now, conservative government. The US right now, moderate uh, democratic government. I think everybody's trying to take the immigration issue off the table. Mm. Yeah. I, I really, I really see that. So Britain's in a bind because they don't have enough workers in the country, but they also um, have spent 20 years telling people that brown migrants coming to the UK is destroying the culture. 
Right. And so, as we talked about extensively in that podcast, they are just trying to get this off the front page. You know, yeah. that, that's what I think. I think they want to they want to get illegal migration off the front page because what they really need to do, ironically, is bring in more migrants. <laughs> that's the irony. Okay, this is all goes back to the same point. And look at the, what the Biden administration's doing. Mm-hmm. They need to get migration off of the front page. Right. So you have Title 42 is really expanded, even though we're being told that it's being restricted. Right. In order to bring in more migrants, because there's not enough employees for U.S. employers. Yeah. And so by the same token, they've just created a new program for 360,000 new, new migrants to come in and are looking to expand the temporary worker programs that I work on so much. Yeah. Uh, it's just funny to me that both the conservative government and Conservatives in England carry around texts by American conservative thinkers. It's very linked. Absolutely. Yeah. Has the same incentive to do the same thing as a moderately liberal left-leaning government in the U.S. And so you tell me what's happening across the Northern Hemisphere. Because I'll tell you right now, and this goes back to our earlier conversation about progressive policies are not winning. Yeah. What's winning, there's an increasing realization that the political thing to do is to increase dramatically security at the southern border. And it could be Trump said that in a way that was off-putting and disgusting, and he didn't know how to implement things, and those were a horrible four years um, for many, many people. But I think he put to words what both parties I've been doing anyway. Yeah. And again, Obama deported more people than Trump. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's a deporter in chief. But the elephant in the room with with all this though is like, does that shit work? And and the answer is no. <laughs> you know, yeah. like all these stories we're carrying, uh, all these stories we've covered so far. Um yeah, people find people find people find a way. Yeah. And and it's yeah, it's like we've said On before. On the rudder of a like, ship for eleven days. Yeah, exactly. On a paraglider and, and, you know, crammed into bumpers, like you're not, you, you just can't logistically fix that. I I don't think so. So what are we really talking about? It's, you know, well, here's the segue. What are we also not talking about? When we increase security at the expense of humanitarian goodwill, perhaps. What happens is there's an increase in deaths, which is what our main story is about. So I know, you know, we, we have a couple other stories we could cover. Let's save it. Yeah. Let's save it. Let's go into our main story here because this, this laws have whenever any decision, right? When you're in business school, any sort of business class, um, you talk about the fact that, uh, uh, we sometimes outsource the costs of something. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. That's not the right term. I forget what the term is. Externalization. Externalize, right? So we have externalized costs. Yeah. Yeah. And the externalized costs of policies that don't take into consideration the entirety of the humanity that is the subject of, let's say, that legislation. So it doesn't take into consideration what's going to happen to those people going to Rwanda once they get there. That doesn't take into consideration the true precarious place of Rwanda next to the Congo, which as we talked about is a militarized zone full of many, many armed people and yada, 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 is that you get these externalities and uh, many times the externality of migration is uh, death for real people. And so we have this amazing article from January, 2023, that is going to be our jumping off point for this main story. It's by again, Alexis Okiowo, who's a staff writer at the New Yorker, where she writes about humanitarian uh, themes and writes about migration. January 9th, she published another article about migration, but this is kind of this big article. It's available in Autumn. For those of you who listen to, uh, like to listen to things, AUDM is an app that reads our chosen articles from several publications. And uh, take us through this, Eli. I mean, what, 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 give us a little summary of, of what we're dealing with here. Do you want me to do that? Yeah, I mean, I've this this story came to mind from like early in my immigration career. I could dive. I could dive yeah. into that quickly. Or should yeah, we, tell yeah. us. Yeah, tell me that. T- 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 tell me that. So I, I I should say. Let me back up, Eli. When we when we discussed this, there is a story that 
this idea of death bring, it brings to brought to mind and Eli, and you're really close to this. I mean, it's an interesting thing um, researching for this for this episode, and I think we all experience to a certain degree in today's world compassion fatigue, right? Um, trying to be an informed human being, and yeah, trying trying to take in what's what's happening in the world, trying to determine your where that line is for you of caring enough to to spur you to action, caring, you know, just just to be aware of things. And it was just, yeah, it was feeling um, just dark reading article after article. If you know, um, I was reading about that tractor trailer outside of San Antonio with the 53 migrants who died inside, um, endless stories in the Mediterranean. Um, and something I worry about in the, in this work where, you know, especially on the humanitarian side is, is losing, um, kind of that interconnection to this work. And for me, there was like one specific day where this all became very real. And I think, I think it's like that with a lot of big issues. Um, we're aware of a lot of things and you'll have one moment where, um, where it becomes real to you. But for me, it was when I was living in, in Louisiana and I would travel, um, to these detention centers. I go to Richwood all the time, which is outside of Monroe. Um, tiny little, uh, used to be like a state prison, I believe, and ICE had taken it over and was using it as a detention center. Um, and in October 2019, um, I was going up there to do client meetings, really, um, to interview some clients that I had there at the direction of this reporter and then some of the attorneys I worked with to look into this suicide. There was a suicide there that made national news, um, Roiland Hernandez-Diaz. Yeah, so I went to Richwood four or five times, and in all my previous visits, I was hearing about this guy. He was not one of our clients. And I never met him, um, but I heard his name uh, like multiple times from other clients who I was meeting with. And he was this like super loud, outspoken guy. Richard was tiny. So like the shared space um, was like half the size of a normal like high school cafeteria. Um, and he was this really talkative guy. He was, everybody d described him as really kind and generous. And he would spend his time going around um, the new arrivals and helping them read their paperwork, helping them fill things in. Um, he was just like really spending his time there trying to build community. And he was leading, um, he led a series of hunger strikes. Um, so out of all the detention centers I went to, Richwood was um, an unbelievable shithole. Just like awful, awful. Like from the moment, the building was super old. Uh, it was just dirty inside. And um, yeah, the stories I heard from from clients there were the, were the worst um, of any detention center I've been to. Um, There's a lot of rotten and moldy food. Um, people with dietary restrictions just weren't being fed. Um, worst of all, they were using solitary left and right as a as a like punishment and control mechanism. None of none of these people in Richwood had serious criminal histories. Most of these people, their their only crime was entering. Um, and it was really being run like a supermax, uh, like a supermax prison, and and solitary was being doled out in like months at a time to people. We had this one client there, um, who just completely unwound. Like in the in the six months uh, that we were representing him, he was um, like really losing his mind, clumps of hair falling out, um, just like in a really really bad state. Um, so it was bad there. And Roiland, this guy was he led um, a few different hunger strikes, and they were kind of they made some local news in, in New Orleans. Um, and going to meetings as this was happening, um, it was atrocious in there. But like the 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 people who had been there for a little while were were engaged in it, and were it's hard to describe, but it, it was like a little bit of hope, you know, for for these people who um, Roiland, I think, had been there for almost a year, like nine months or something like that. So yeah, he was this big presence. And um, basically he tried to secure his release from ICE again for the second or third time. Um, in October, he was denied. Um, two days later, um, he started another hunger strike and was immediately thrown into solitary. And then six days after that, um, he was dead of an apparent suicide. It's, it's really hard to describe that day. Um, but walking in there and and meeting with people and trying to figure out what had happened, um, yeah, there was just like an unbelievable amount of of despair. And you know, I was trying to put together this this story or kind of like tell what had happened for this reporter, um, and that almost felt a little disingenuous because like this whole um, the way Richwood operated 
nothing had changed. It had just like broken this this um, this one guy. Ba- basically, the only story what to tell was that um, you know these little collective actions um, and Royland's mental health had just been steamrolled mm. unceremoniously. I don't know. I don't know why it was him or that day. And and like I said, I didn't know him individually. But yeah, that that really really hit me that day. There's just there's such a I think why so many immigration topics are so charged is this this like very specific intersection of a big blundering bureaucracy and like the most intimate human, um, like the most intimate human sphere, the family, you know? Yeah. And just, just watching like a big, dumb bureaucracy steamroll people. is just like a special type of, uh, depressing, infuriating, um, and yeah, that that was really the first day. Um, I was sitting in my car, um, just kind of processing things, and I remember just feeling mad. <laughs> just be like, I fucking paid for this, <laughs> you know? Like I, I pay for this shit. You pay for this shit. You know, we all pay for this shit. Um, you mean like our taxes? Go? Our taxes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that day was when, you know, I'd care. I, I grew up in a family that was involved with the Spanish speaking community, and. In North Carolina, I've traveled a lot in Central America, and I love the culture. So I cared about this issue already. Um, that's why I was doing this work. This the, that day took it kind of past my general uh, general concerns, made it really uh, personal, really individual to me. So so that that whole story just kind of popped into my head um, researching this issue of of migrant deaths. Um, Do you know what happened to him after he was uh, was he repatriated? After he was found dead, like what, what, what was the path for his body after that? Yes. So he, he was repatriated. The, um, his wife is inter- interviewed a few times. Um, there's a lot more to the story. Um, her opinion is that, um, he's not someone who would ever commit suicide and that she'd spoken to him a few days before and he'd sounded him fine spirits. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's horrified and confused and doesn't feel like he could have ever killed himself. Um, Richwood is, we had another client in Richwood who I went in, had a big gash on his forehead and I asked him what happened. And uh, a nice officer was trying to get him to sign paperwork and he stood up because he was refusing until his attorney was there. And the guy took his head, like slammed it on the desk. So I know there was, I know there was violence there. There was one of those uh, hunger strikes was broken up pretty violently. Like one of our clients got hit with a pepper ball, um, like six feet away or something like that. So there was violence there. Whether or not they, you know, who who knows, um, who knows what happened to to Royland, but his, um, yeah, his wife to this day um, is speaking up a lot about it. There's there's a lot of different interviews with her, but I do think that um, he was repatriated back um, to Cuba eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we, when we read this piece, um, which talks a lot about what happens on these journeys which talks exclusively about what happens on a journey after somebody dies right what happens to their family there's this idea of an ambiguous loss so Mm -hmm. if you can't verify that somebody's died you can't fully grieve in your case if you can't verify how somebody died or refuse to believe it because the circumstances seem so nightmarish yeah. Right. Um, you can't fully process it. And um, that's a theme, right? right? That's a theme. And so you multiply this by, um, I think it's 25,000 migrant deaths in the Mediterranean since 2014, according to uh, the Missing Migrants Project out of Switzerland, right? Yeah. Um, I think worldwide, that number approaches somewhere around 40,000 a year that we know of, but it's probably an undercount, right? So there, there's, there's a lot of just ambiguous pain and these bodies themselves, just like the body of, say his name again? Uh, Royland. Royland become politicized and they become fodder more often than not, not for uh, causes that support ways to make migration safer, Right. The, that's not the loudest side, but actually to, to end migration altogether. And that's what I want to talk about. Okay. Because I hear that story and I've been to many detention centers 
Um, and I've seen many similar stories and been a part of them in some way as a representative. And I say, well, obviously we need to just stop putting migrants who are detained civilly into prisons that themselves shouldn't really even exist in the form that they do. And, you know, obviously, but somebody else hears that story and they go, well, obviously these people should just go home. Like, why wouldn't they self-deport? Yeah. Why wouldn't they just go back? And, and that's why personal stories are important. That's why his story is important. You know, he was fleeing Cuba because um, he was advocating for higher pay for trained medical professionals and the government um, hunted him down like three or four times. The last time they threw him in prison, he was in uh, prison for nine years. Um, for speaking up, then came to the U S and, um, yeah, I mean, that's part of why his story is so, and, and we're moving past this, but this just tied right into his story. You know, this guy's an advocate. He's speaking up in Cuba and getting like pilloried and thrown in jail. He ends up in Richwood outside of Monroe. Um, it's just the most like otherworldly area. It's insane. The point is that in death, um, whatever we have these migrants that on their journeys in detention are away from the public eye. It's only in death when all we have is their bodies or a memory of their bodies or that, you know, we have a sunken ship somewhere so that we know the bodies are on that they once again become symbols. Right. 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 And the thing is we, when you hear of a, ship in the Gulf of Mexico, or you hear of dead bodies on the border of, uh, in Death Valley on the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, which we'll talk about, or you hear about 40,000 missing people after the wars in Bosnia and the former Yugoslavia, it's really easy to go, okay, okay, that's done, right? Like, how do we, let's just think about the issue of, you know, how to prevent further migration or how to maybe make it safer or something, but those bodies are very political and there's a lot that happens to them. And that's what this yeah. episode in yeah. uh, theory is about. Yeah. And this letter from Italy, the missing is interesting to me because it raises several issues. Okay. First of all, there are family members that are interested and want to know that somebody's actually died. So you have to yeah. ID these bodies yeah. and, Sometimes, in only about 30% of cases, you'll have a body that can be ID'd and maybe you do DNA matching. The story talks about that. But most of the time, you're talking about a different types of forensics where through interviews of people who may be the smugglers themselves, maybe other people that traveled with a missing person, talks with family members, you can try to surmise, are they alive or not? Right. Then you have this idea that a lot of people die in areas that have no jurisdiction where no country has to take a responsibility for the safety or not of the migrants. And it raises to me this interesting question, you know, can we afford in a country of 10 billion, in a world of 10 billion people where we know people are constantly moving, can we further afford to leave areas of the world free of any country's jurisdiction? Hmm. In other words, are there areas of the world that nobody can be responsible for? that nobody can be responsible for human lives for. And when I think about your friend uh, in Richmond, uh, who died in the Richmond, tell me his name again, I'm Rich, sorry. Uh, Richwood, uh, Royland. Richwood, when I think of Royland, I think of somebody that died in what I call the American hinterland, that died in a place that Americans pretend, or don't, some don't even know, really exists. Yes. Right. When people go to prison, we forget about them. When people go to detention centers, it's even a little different. We forget about them, but, but we don't even know that they're actually there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And it might as well be an area without law. Yeah. And I personally believe that guy probably was violated in some way. Yeah. Before death, because I've seen yeah. it too much. Right. Yeah. Um, but how would we go about getting justice for that person? The answer is probably you're not going to get justice for that person because once a body is, once somebody dies and they're repatriated, it's, you know, how are you going to investigate his death? Who are you going to blame? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, who are you going to blame if, if everybody can just say, well, he's, he's a product of 
a system that put him in de- detention center, which, yeah, it's a terrible place, but the law says he has to go there. Right. Who are you going to blame if somebody dies on a ship on their way to Italy, right? Uh, or on their way to Spain, and neither Italian nor Maltesian authorities, you know, want to help the drowning people on the ship. Right. The who you're going to blame part is missing in many of these cases. Yeah. And so the issues really become personal tragedies because all you're left with then is a family who's lost a family member who needs to ID that member often for reasons that are really important. Yeah. Sometimes to get things like public benefits for their children, right? Because they have a missing parent and they can't ID them. Sometimes to emigrate themselves out of a bad situation. You can't emigrate with children if the uh, father or mother, right, can't be accounted for. They don't have a death certificate. Right. And uh, I guess what I'm saying is that I think the, not only do we not have good solutions for people while they're alive and moving, we have even less solutions for Mm -hmm. what happens after they die. And there are very real problems that remain. Right. Yeah. I was, I was interested by you choosing this topic because my first reaction to it is we can't figure out how to not brutalize the people who are alive. So, so isn't this, this issue peripheral to that? Like, you know, how, how would we ever, I mean, I, I think this is important and I think it's one of those questions that needs to be asked to try to determine, you know, the character of your policy and the character of your, of your nation. And, and I think we're doing the opposite now. It's so reactionary. I think it's important to try to like identify, but I'm curious why kind of what made you land on this? Cause you see what I'm saying? It, it just, yeah, so, yeah. so it's super interesting to me because we, we spend, um, it's, it's a total hidden area. Right. Yeah. We spend a lot of time talking about what do governments, uh, what do nations, what do groups of nations need to do to help people moving from one area, maybe of conflict or of disaster to another. We never hear about, well, what do you do with the bodies of the dead and the hurt and the wounded and the maimed? Yeah. Why isn't that a governmental responsibility of somebody? Hmm. Right. Yeah. And this whole article talk, you know, talks to a coroner who works out of Italy. Uh, she's a professor that uh, runs a private lab funded by only nonprofit money. The government won't fund it. And she is the one person, maybe in all of Europe, that's working on identifying the bodies of migrants. And she has many hundreds of families that call her trying to have their loved ones identified for very practical reasons. They need death certificates yeah. for many different reasons. Yeah, And she got six minutes recently to speak at the United Nations, I want to say, on this issue and the need for governments to actually take ownership of people dying in and around their jurisdictions, right? To raise the ships full of migrants, to identify those bodies. She got six minutes, right? To talk about this big issue, right? 8,000 migrants died in the Mediterranean in 2016, 25,000 since 2014, right? There's a lot of bodies that would potentially need to be ID'd. But she got no response because politicians, people just don't think this is their responsibility. Yeah. It's interesting to me that we can talk so passionately about being invaded and about the future possibility of losing our culture, but we can be dead silent even on the left about the fact that tens of thousands of people die every year on this crossing yeah, and we don't have anything yeah. for those bodies, anything for their family members. There's, there's no response. Yeah. That to me sounds weird. It's a weird thing. That angle actually helps a lot. I, I think it, I mean, it seems like it must be a purposeful omission and in a lot of ways. Why? You're further humanizing these, these individuals by, by contemplating this fact that a lot of them do not make it. Yeah. And I, I just think there's, you know, how does that fit into border security? You know, how does, how does that narrative, how does kind of like I was saying before, we're so far, <laughs> we just seem so far morally from this being an important issue to anybody in power, which is. I can see a world where there is, okay. So first of all, there is, we have in the past created an organization, a legally empowered organization, the International Commission on Missing Persons, to identify missing bodies and to con- you know let families know. So this was in the war 
in the former Yugoslavia, 40,000 people were missing, and the International Commission on Missing Persons identified 70% of those bodies, digging up, digging up mass graves, doing what was then like very basic compared to now DNA identification. Um, and that, that was a big deal. That was a big success of the Clinton administration. It was used again, the International Commission on Missing Persons. It came into uh, focus again in 2004 after victims of the huge tsunami right mm. that hit um the indian ocean i think 200,000 people died and it identified thousands of those who were missing right all across the world yeah so we have recognized in the past that identifying bodies is really important it's a it's a human humanitarian uh issue it's a it's a moral issue but it's also an issue that governments should take responsibility for because individuals can't do it it's not a problem that can be solved by individuals by through private means right okay the right. answer becomes, why do we forget that when we have yearly thousands of these small tragedies, as, as, um, as is stated in this article, Alexis Okiowo says, you know, every year we have thousands of small tragedies, a fishing ship with five people dies, you know, but then you have once in a while a ship with a thousand people or 300 people. Why do we not treat that in the same way? If the numbers are comparable to something like a tsunami or to, to mm. one single war. And a part mm. of it is simply because I think it's too painful. Yeah. I think it's too painful. I think it's too painful for everybody. That was my exact point earlier with, with compassion fatigue is, is where do you draw that line? Yeah. You got to feel that pain to, uh, for me, at least that's. That's how I get inspired in, in some senses, you know, yeah. is that specific type of, of pain. But yeah. But see, I think if the governments like, and people couldn't look away because there was a program that actually dealt with picking up these bodies, mm -hmm. I think we would have uh, much more realistic policies yeah. that wouldn't, and I'm, I'm, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not saying that would be like completely humanitarian. I, I mean, realistic. I think you would be forced to have more of a political discussion about this. It would make it a hell of a lot harder uh, to use words like invasion. I mean, I was I was going to yeah. make this point a little um, a little further on with the uh, the other Death Valley, as they're calling yeah. it, which is um, Brooks County in Texas. But yeah, the de the descriptions of of this area, this area has become the the deadliest land crossing in the world. Okay, so tell which, me this. Yeah. So, so okay, yeah. so so first set set the stage here for Death Valley, so we can talk about it a bit. Yeah. So this is I thought this piece dovetailed in nicely nice is a weird word uh for the topic with this previous article um because it deals with a lot of the same issues just on the u.s mexico border um and brooks county it covers like a thousand square miles um in texas it's pretty rural it's a lot of like ranch land um and it's the most deadly area of the border basically long story short they put in the biggest port of entry right in brooks county um and since then, people have gone further and further around, deeper into the desert um, to come through undetected. Um, and the descriptions I was reading um, of just the sheer, the sheer number in this area, there were 715 deaths of people in, in 2021 alone in this area. Um, like I said, deadliest land crossing in the world, which I was not aware of. It's the deadliest it, land crossing in the world? That's that's on what the, the U.S. border. That's what the Guardian. This yeah, this Guardian article is saying that. Holy um, shit! We didn't. Yeah, I didn't know that. I had no idea. To my point earlier, we don't think about the deaths. That is a fascinating point. That we have the deadliest crossing in the world is our border. Tell me more about that. How many people yeah. a year? Seven hundred and fifteen um, in twenty twenty one. And the Brooks County Sheriff estimates, those are based off of uh, recovered, recovered bodies in 2021. He estimates they're finding one in five. Well, that would, that would go along with figures of the Missing Pe People's Project, which estimates that 70% of bodies are never recovered, not even any remains. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're, yeah, so we're talking, you know, what, 4,000 people? And that, that's because they're eaten by animals, right? They decompose. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, th I think... Dehydration was the biggest one around. around well, that's why here. people die. But I'm saying why the bodies disappear. Oh, right, 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 right. Absolutely. And it's a huge area. It's mm -hmm. a huge, huge uncharted area. So if he's right, that would be 3,500 bodies. Yeah, right? in, in 2021. Right. Um, and if it was 30% of bodies, because 70% couldn't be found. Yeah. So it's like 230 times. Then it would be about 2,200 bodies. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and my, my point with this, reading all this stuff, reading about these ranchers talking about the number of people they're finding, you know, in their like outer fields and, um, stories of finding, you know, whole families huddled together and dead out in the desert. Um, doesn't look like a fucking invasion to me. Mm. <laughs> it's people freaking limping onto the, the edges of these ranches and killing over dead. You know, it's women, children, entire families. Uh, your, your point's actually really coming into focus. I think um, becoming more reticent of this fact makes it so much more difficult um, to use some of those buzzwords that have become um, so effective, so popular. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm one of my favorite, favorite allegories, I guess, stories, uh, that I repeat to my kids, um, as you have a, you have a ship, you know, 300 years ago and there's a heavy storm and everybody on the ship is praying, 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 praying. And the ship goes down, but there's one survivor and, and she comes, she's a pious woman and she comes to the beach and, you know, local villagers come up on her and they say, Oh, how did you survive? She said, I prayed to God. Everybody else is praying to God. And so it's a bias towards survivors, right? There's a survivor's bias in faith. Mm -hmm. There's a survivor's bias in politics. Mm -hmm. That's my point. I think immigration has a tremendous, it, it suffers tremendously. The whole issue of immigration and, and the moving of people suffers from survivor's bias. Right. I think people imagine this wave, this crushing wave of, of invasion precisely because they can only see the world of the living. Hmm. They don't take into account the world of the dead and the maimed. And like you said, when you remember that and we now we found out, I mean, we're finding out in real time. I just did from you that yeah. upwards of 2000 people are dying on this one stretch of desert yeah. in the United States. Potentially. I was freaking blown away. I thought I was, I didn't know Malia existed before we started, <laughs> we started this. this. I didn't know. I do want to double check that the guardian, uh, reports and stuff a lot though. I did not know we had potentially the deadliest land crossing in the world, in the world. So I just want to quickly highlight, uh, Marc Gasol. Yeah. Okay. Marc Gasol, Memphis Grizzlies legend. Okay. He also played, uh, who did he play for before that? He played, uh, played on the Lakers for a bit. I remember him in the Lakers for sure. I mean, yeah. Paul Gasol was on the Lakers for a while, but Mark played there, I want to say, for a season. Oh, Toronto. World oh. Championship winner with the Toronto Raptors. That's what it was. Poor okay. Mark. It just clicked in my head yeah, that we were yeah, talking yeah, yeah. about Mark. Not <laughs> yeah, Mark. Yeah, Mark. Mark. All right, right? got it. He okay. is, that's why I was giving, saying he was much yeah. Marcus Pudger. Yeah, right. you were thinking of, yeah, that's right. Please no, continue. Okay. Please continue. Uh, and so Mark, in 2018, he dons a helmet, puts on, you know, uh, rescuer's garb, and he's actually jumping into the Mediterranean, uh, you know, with humanitarian organizations there, pulling dead bodies out of the water. Yeah. Right. And he's, he actually saves a few people from drowning, right? Wow. Wow. And we, we talked about before. You know, what do you, what do you do if you're somebody like a Coast Guard? Yeah. Right. And we talked about governments, uh, discouraging nonprofits and private actors from going in. And yet we should also highlight that if you want to do that, you very much can. Yeah. I mean, you and I were crazy. We went, we went to these refugee camps on the border. We went to detention centers. You can yeah. do that. Yeah. Right. So, so, so there is, there is that hope of, of saving and you as a private actor do, and I would want to ask him, I think he's the first guy I'm going to like try to get, get for this podcast. After you know, Nagano, I think. I, I, I think given where Marcus all was, I, I, you know, I, I'd want all of them, but I, yeah. I feel like Mark would come cause he seems like this is a, this is a passion place for him. Yeah, but I don't have much to say about him except uh, we'll put some links on the podcast about what he's done. Yeah, and and that's a good. Do you have anything you want to say about him? No, I mean the the story really it really speaks to me. I think um, you know, like Brian Stevenson has that whole idea of getting proximate, um, 
you know, the only Brian Stevenson, you and my friend Ben Schobert, Brian Stevenson. Are you an anti Brian Stevenson guy? Yeah, go ahead, go on. To... Okay, all right. Yeah, I don't know. Getting uh, getting close to something and going out there and experiencing it for yourself. Yeah, it's it's an amazing, especially for for a guy in the NBA. Um, you know, it reminds me of like Roberto Clemente. Um, you know, flying supplies. It's it's a pretty amazing thing, and I. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear more of his thoughts on it because I think I think that's when um, that's when you kind of figure out what you care about and what you don't. Uh, it's when you actually go and like touch and smell it, you know. So that was that was my thought. With, uh, it's a good closing thought. We'll see you next episode, episode six. Thanks, Thanks guys. so much for joining the Ten Billion People Podcast. Take care.